श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री द्वैत गदाकार श्री वासुदेव गौरव गोविंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे सो फॉर दिस अनाउंसमेंट दैट टुडे इज मदर्स डे दैट्स नाइस आई लव मदर टू लव and might have been in a previous life. <laughs> so, of course, we do celebrate the uh, Mom Vishnu Padari Krishna Pastai Bhutale Shemakki Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tamamine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gurmani Pacharine Namasesa Sunya Bhadi Paskyatya Devi Sakarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitya Ananda Siya Dharika Gyanahara Sivasadi Gaurabhata Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Hare 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 It was based on the principle of respect. Uh, where there is no respect for either God or for, he, for others, it's not really a civilization. It's just, just, it's more like, we might use a strong word, it's just animals. Respect is natural, or just might we say it's seems like it's, not seems like, but it is natural to human being to give respect to others. But because people don't even respect themselves, if they can't respect others, how can I respect uh, the supreme personality of God? The real civilized culture teaches what is called the culture of respect, and how to honor different categories of people within the society, within the family, Uh, within the world, and of course, ultimately, that respect ultimately is for God. So, one of the categories of respect is there's a certain class of people are known as mothers. Now, in the Western societies, mothers is a very limited term, <coughs> or its term is limited to someone who is your was brought you into the world, your mother, in that sense. But in the, when we say civilized or broader sense of the cultural aspect of the human being, mother is one who is really gives nourishment, care, uh, provides needs. So in Vedic culture, when there are, it's described there are seven mothers, seven mothers. Your real mother, the mother that actually brings you into the world, is one of the seven mothers. But then there is the wife of the leader within society. The leader of society, in society, in the ideal culture, is supposed to be the representative of God, the king. He is called the Rajarsi, Raja Rishi. Raja means king and Rishi means sage. So the leader of a society is meant to be a representative of God, and so he is called, uh, he's called the Raja Rishi, a sage who is actually a king, or a king who is actually a sage, that's better. So his wife is considered the mother also of all. Sometimes we say the first lady, <laughs> we might use that term. <clears throat> She's also given respect on the same level as the leader within society. And then the wife of the Brahman, or those who are in the priestly class, their wives are also considered mothers to everyone also. Because the Brahmins provide direction within society, but they also provide uh, spiritual direction, and also they give <coughs> material direction also, through their words, through their examples, through their renunciation. And so their wives are also considered to be mothers, or re referred to as mother. Um, the wife of the spiritual master. And the spiritual master can not only necessarily is one who is in the renounced order, but he also may be a great house to marry, 
his wife is also considered to be a mother <coughs> and respected in that way, or seen in that way as mother. And then there is the nurse in Vedic culture, civilized culture. Not only does the mother bring in the child, but once the, the child comes in and there's a nurse there to also give nourishment, care, and attention to the child. Uh, sometimes they say midwife. And that is also considered mother. This is the fourth of all mothers. So then there is, no, that's five, that's five. The real mother, the wife of the Brahmin, the wife of the king, the wife of the guru, the nurse. And then there is mother cow. The cow is also considered to be mother. She provides uh, milk, which is milk, according to Vedic culture, is meant or actually not only Vedic culture, but scientific understanding, is that to develop um, spiritual intelligence, one should drink milk, <laughs> or a sufficient amount of milk, not too much, of course, because milk nourishes the finer brain tissues within the, the brain, which helps to understand spiritual topics. <coughs> so um, the cow gives milk, also gives dung. Dung, is, the cow dung is actually very medicinal. Even scientists have examined cow dung. It has all medicinal products. And many medicines are made from cow dung. In our farms in uh, India, we have many farms, which we have many cows. And we actually make products from the cow. Toothpaste, hair, shampoo, soap, lotions, creams, so many things can be made from cow dung. And also, people who want to keep good health, you can drink cow urine. Maybe it sounds a little hard, but actually, of course you should distill it first, because there may be some bacteria in it. But distilled cow urine is quite healthy, and prevents cancer, and gives nourishment to the organs in the body. <coughs> That's a fact. And that's been proven even by science. Um, I've seen cow dung is so powerful that it can it can uh, motivate a clock just by cow dung. You take the leads of a clock, two wires, you put it into two pools of cow dung, cow yarn combination, and the clock runs. I've seen it. <laughs> so there's so much in cow dung. And of course, great sages take cow dung and put it all over their body. When we do worship on the altar, there's a thing called pancha gavya. Pancha means five, gavya means from the cow, five substances from the cow is the is milk, yogurt, ghee, cow urine, and cow dung, and we bathe the deities with that. So there's a ceremony where the deity gets bathed with cow dung and cow urine. So that's how pure the cow dung is. It has all nitrates, all medicinal qualities in cow dung. So, and the cow, of course, what does it take? A little bit of grass, some hay, and it gives such nourishing food as milk. And from milk you make so many wonderful things, like sandash and burfi and sweet rice. So what else? <laughs> Rascula. <laughs> you could go on ice cream. Ice cream. <coughs> Simply wonderful. Paneer. Oh, yes. Paneer. Cheap. Perfect. If we keep going this way, it'll be time for lunch. <laughs> 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 I go for <laughs> so there's so much in, in, in the cow, the cow is just, the cow is, in the real sense, if you really want to say, she's really a mother, in the real sense of the word. Because she's selfless, she just gives and doesn't ask for much, just a little care and a little grass, that's all. And then the last of all mothers is called Mother Earth. And that's how we read her, you hear that terminology applied to various societies, the mother the earth is like mother, because we live on the earth, she provides uh, soil so we can grow food, um, of course, you know, she gives so much <coughs> trees and 
the earth itself nourishes the living being. So she is also considered mother. So in the Vedic society, or what we might say, human society, these, these seven categories of living entities are considered to be mother. And therefore they should be respected and honored in that sense. And so in Vedic culture, there is a culture of respect, not only for God, but for, for each other, according to different categories of relationships like that. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was Krishna himself, um, he appeared in this world in the year 1486 in order to propagate the teachings of the Sakratana woman and to teach the principles of pure devotional service to the world. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu grew up in a very, what we say, uh, well-to-do Brahmin family. And his mother, who was really a respectable person within the village society, her father was one of the greatest astrologers and philosophers within that. The Lord Chaitanya, who appeared through this personality, and his name was Sachimata, she appeared at his mother. And when Lord Chaitanya at one point performed his leela of leaving home to go out and propagate the Sankirtan movement and to accept the renounced order of life, although he was God, he was performing this to teach us, his mother was very much disturbed <laughs> because she had had she had a very rough life. She had eight girls, no, seven, seven or eight? Eight, eight, that all died right after childbirth. I mean, that, you know, for a mother to go through that, man, that's, that would be a calamitous situation. Probably so calamitous that that could be, cause one to have a, you know, this mental breakdown, depression. But each of these girls that were born to her died right after they were born. And then she had a son, whose name was Vishwarup, who was an expansion of Lord Balaram and not the Sesh himself. But when he got marriageable age, he decided to give it all up, and he left and took sannyas and never came back. And she never saw her son again after the age of 16. He just left, and no one saw him. No one who knew him ever saw him again. And so then Haroni's other son was Lord Chaitanya. So at one point he wanted to leave and take sannyas, and so you can imagine how she was feeling. <laughs> you know, such attachment, not only for her son, but her son was the supreme personality of God, although she wasn't consciously aware of that. Still her affection and her attachment was so deep. And she had lost her husband too. Her husband had left a few years before, right after her her younger, her elder son disappeared. He also left the planet. So that was her only family member left, was Lord Chaitanya. He had decided to take some house. So how was she feeling? And of course, she went through a very difficult time. And finally, <clears throat> the Lord told him, he said, actually, my, he said to his mother, actually, my mind, my body belongs to you. You are giver of my body, and I owe you everything. So you simply give me a request. So she said, if you leave and never come back, and, and I will, what will I do? And I, will, I will be able to live. So I have one request. Please stay in Jagannath Puri, <laughs> which was not so far from Navadweep. It could be traveled within a month or so. Well, in those days, travel was much slower. So um, he agreed to stay in Jagannath Puri and perform his pastimes rather than go to Vrindavan, which was his original intention, which would have been thousands of kilometers away from his mother, just to satisfy his mother. <laughs> so this is the, the nature of the Supreme Personality of God, and he wanted to please his mother, and not disappoint his mother and make her unhappy. So, in a culture of Krishna consciousness, sometimes young boys and girls, they leave their families and join the Hare Krishna movement, right? It happens, right? And what happens, the parents feel a little unhappy sometimes, 
you know, I had big prayer programs and plans for my son and daughter, and now everything's changed. They became a Hare Krishna, what happened? <laughs> so, I'm sure many of those of us who have joined them when their parents come through it, a lot of them. And sometimes they become really, really, really quite depressed. And, um, but Srila Prabhupada <clears throat> didn't want us to not leave the family and move on. But he said, always oh, stay in contact with your parents. And he says, your parents are also part and parcel of Krishna. They're also, in one sense, very dear to Krishna. His Krishna loves each and every living being equally. Krishna samoham sabhabhute shu. Krishna says, I envy no one. I am not partial to anyone. I am equal to everyone. So his equality is that he has complete and unalloyed love for each and every living entity because they're part and parcel of him. So that goes with our family members too and all people within society. So that is the understanding of the devotee. A devotee sees not simply the body of the living being but actually the soul within the body who that soul belongs to Krishna. <laughs> It doesn't belong to anyone but Krishna. Although we have these roles that we play in this world, but they're simply meant to help us carry on our duties in this world. But our real role, our real relationship is that each living being is part of Krishna, whether it's sons, mothers, daughters, friends, fathers, or just people in general. Every living being is Krishna's part and parcel. and very dear to Krishna. So Prabhupada told us, and he said, don't neglect your parents <laughs> when you join the Hare Krishna movement. Still stay in contact with them and try to bring them to Krishna consciousness and make them favorable, and at least give them some respect and like that. <laughs> so it's not like sometimes people say, but why, <clears throat> why do you neglect your parents? We don't neglect our parents. If we move on in a way that is meant to reach the goal of life, but at the same time, we give respects to parents, especially mothers. Mothers are important. You know, there's a Father's Day and there's a Mother's Day, right? But which day is more important? I know I come from the Amer America, and Mother's Day is every, every, it's always the second weekend in May. It's May 8th this year. And everybody celebrates Mother's Day, but people forget about Father's Day. <laughs> it's just somehow, oh yeah, that's right, we just missed it, it just passed. It's in June sometime, <laughs> we don't even remember the date. It's on the calendar, but it's not so important. <laughs> well, it's not like I'm playing down the importance of fathers, because without a father, you can't make it either. <laughs> you can ask your mother about that. <laughs> it's so tough. But the point is that there is a special, and we can take, we can actually say that take it on another level. Mother represents caring, nurturing, uh, shelter, uh, nourishment. Father represents more or less direction. Uh, each of the parents more or less play a particular type of role in the life of the living being. So, of course, for a living being to grow up nicely, a balance is there. The father's strictness, the mother's love. Right? To have just the mother's love without the father's strictness, may, the child may be spoiled. And just to have the mother's the father's strictness without the mother's love, the child may simply be hard hearted or not sensitive to the, their own needs and emotions. So even that's invaded culture and that is there. And it's like Krishna is considered to be the father of all living beings and Radharani is considered to be the mother. So Prabhupada and says that Janmastami is the appearance day of Krishna and Radhastami is the appearance day of Srimati Radharani. So on Janmastami we fast all day, up until midnight. 
And then Rad asked him maybe fast half a day. So Prabhupada said, Mother's more kind of father. <laughs> <laughs> He actually said that in relationship to Radharani. <laughs> and so that's the nature. Of course, in this society, our society is making, is, is exploiting the mother nature, the womanly nature, and changing it around and women are becoming different. But that is not their nature. The woman's nature is by nature very really sensitive, loving, caring, emotional. And therefore, we honor mothers as much as we honor the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Krishna showed by his own example how he honored his mother, how he cared for his mother, how he listened to his mother, and how Lord Chaitanya, uh, although he wanted to leave, his mother requested not to, he still allowed his mother to have association with him, although he was a sannyasi, which is really against sannyas dharma. Well, sannyas means you leave all your family relationships, all your family attachments, and you go on and preach. But Chaitanya changed that principle just to show how we should respect mothers like that. My mother, she's 93. You know? She's 93. She just stopped driving her car this year. <laughs> that, that's the truth. Yeah. She, she, she finally decided, I better stop driving. <laughs> I've been telling her for years, but she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, when I took Sonia, when I came to the Hare Krishna movement and took Sonia, she was kind of disappointed. No grandchildren, I would say. <laughs> Well, she's still waiting for grandchildren. <laughs> of course, my sister is there and she saved me. <laughs> she got married, had two nice grandkids, two kids. So. But, you know, she feels a little bit disappointed like I didn't fulfill my role as a dutiful son. <laughs> but still, I go to see her and try to, you know, she appreciates Krishna consciousness. And that's nice. She's had to appreciate it because she had no choice <laughs> over the years. <laughs> but no, I see actually she has some sentiment for the for the movement. But the nature of of a devotee is that we give respects to all. And um, the devotee is always in the mood of trying to see how to serve, not trying to see how to be served. So in relationship to these mothers, especially our own mother, we serve. Of course, the cow, well, we can talk about the cow a little bit. The cow is a very important aspect within society. Of course, in, in London, you don't see too many cows. It's more like cars. But cows, you know, for, for a, a culture is necessary because cow provides so much and they're honored and respected and not abused or killed. And sometimes people think that's artificial, but it's not actually, because it explains that there are, the sin of killing a cow is so bad that it causes the nation to suffer tremendously. Not only the people who are involved in directly the killing, and those who are indirectly, but everyone suffers if they are part of a culture or society that, that sanctions the killing of cows. It's such a severe... It says that directly, if a cow is killed, seven people are implicated in the sinful activity. The one who kills it, and the one who... Um, let me see. The one who transports it, the one who... Uh, who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who cooks it, and the one who eats it. In other words, it's such a heavy thing because we speak about Krishna, you know, we speak about his planet. The highest planet in the spiritual world is called Go Loka. Loka means planet, Go means cow. So actually, this is not some anthropomorphic or some kind of you know, story. 
Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, loves cows. <laughs> he very much gives his attention to cows. It says there are five types of people in society that we should never be exploited and should always be cared for. And those five are children, women, old people, priestly class, and the cows. And out of those five, as far as contributions to society, the Brahmins and the cows give the greatest contribution. And as far as those two, the cows are the most important. So Krishna gives his most care, most, most protection, and most concern to cows. Anyone who's helpless, and if they're exploited by others, that is the greatest sin. That's why these five categories of people are given the most concern and the most care. So to honor mothers is not simply to give them a present on, their, on Mother's Day or on their birthday. Honor mothers to actually honor the roles they play. And what is that role? Well, that actually to bring children into the world, to care for children. Sometimes people say, oh, it's, you know, to take sannyas is a very difficult thing. But I think to be a mother is more difficult from what I see. Because especially in this society where there's very little support for motherhood, very much, you know, things are different. Whereas in Vedic society, there was a grand celebration just at the time when the father plants the seed in the mother for the child. At that day, there's a celebration. And then at the birth of the child, there's another celebration. And at the first year of the child, that's another celebration. So in Vedic society, there's celebrations at various on different times of bringing the child into the world. It's such a sacred thing, and it's given honor and respect. So therefore, um, um, a woman or a, a mother is considered to be glorious and meant to give respect in that sense because of the role she plays. Unfortunately, today society is trying to change that role and make it into something different, but it can never be changed. <laughs> The essence it can never be changed. It can be minimized, it can be abused, but it can never be changed. So Prabhupada said about himself, he said, I have the mind of an, an English army officer and I have the heart of a Bengali mother. <laughs> so if you know those two, you can understand a great personality. A mind of an English army officer, I'm sure you maybe have a little experience. Strong mind. And the heart of a Bengali woman, so soft. So soft, so sweet, so caring. So that's Prabhupada when he would speak about himself. And he said that's what it means to be a devotee, to have strong mind and soft heart. To combine the father and mother aspect in one and act in that way. <coughs> So that's why the nourishment of a living being requires both the father and the mother to get the strictness of the father, the direction of the father, and the care and love of the mother, the child goes next time. So today is a very special day. Every day is special. In Vedic culture, we honor living beings every day. In some days, it's it's given a special occasion, a special focus. But in Vedic culture, I like that. To honor others is just as important, or even more important, than honoring Krishna. Because Krishna likes when we honor others more important than when we honor him, or serve others. So, call up your mother today. <laughs> and if you're a mother, Be happy. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's a nice day. Every day is a nice day. That's about the way the Vedic culture is. There's no one, every day is a reason for celebration. Why? What are we celebrating? We're celebrating the end of our existence in this temporary material world. You know, as, as time goes on, people think as time goes on, things get go worse. You know? 
is youth is if this is the biggest fallacy in Western society that youth is the focus of life. But in Vedic culture, youth is considered folly, <laughs> ignorance. It's when you grow up and you become mature and you experience life, then you're considered to be wise and, and people take direction and guidance from you. And then your life has more and more responsibility, more meaning. So also in, in Krishna consciousness, we understand as time goes on, we're getting closer and closer to the end of this body. And the perfection of the end of this body is to leave this world and never come back again. And that means to be fully Krishna conscious. So time never, look, look at Srila Prabhupada. He began the Krishna conscious movement at 70. Where most people are thinking retirement and a more of an easier life, he jumped in a boat and was sailing across the world and then had to live in a very foreign culture and learn how to you know, deal with all the difficulties that came by way of that new environment from trying to spread a, a world, create a world movement. So from Prabhupada's life from 70 to 80, he astounded the world with his books, with his travels, with his teachings, with his meeting with many, many important people around the world. It's a great history. So as time goes on, old age or older age is actually a chance to really go deeper into, you know, when you're young you still have so many desires, so many plans, so many programs. And that's nice. That's normal. The age of 18 to 32 is called Nava Yogana. That means, it does, in the scriptures it said 18 to 32 means you just want to experience the world. <laughs> What's out there? Let me go for it. But then after a while you realize it's not what it's supposed to be. <laughs> You become experienced and you start to become more serious about making, you know, your life valuable by using your time in the best way. And that is, that is to do two things, it is to practice spiritual life according to your situation and to understand what is the goal of that spiritual life. And the goal is to actually be, to go back to the spiritual world, not to stay in this material world. And in the spiritual world, there are mothers, there are fathers, and there are children. As Prabhupada says, the spiritual, the material world is simply a prototype or a reflection of the reality. What you see in this world is simply a reflection of what exists in the real world. The real real world. This is not the real world. This is a drama. Of course, we have to play the drama nicely. Right? We play our roles within the drama. But we're not the characters we're playing. We're something different. Behind the role, there is the real identity, and that is who we are. And we are not these bodies. But that to tell you who you're not doesn't tell you who you are. Right? If I tell you you're not this body, you say, well, that's nice. <laughs> well, who am I? <laughs> and then the, the rest of them, the uh, explanation is Jivir Surupai Nitya Krishna Das, that all living beings are eternally related into the Supreme Lord God, Krishna, eternally. And the roles we play in this world, whether it's mother, father, whatever, we should play these roles good. It's not like because we're not the roles we're playing, we don't play them properly. No. We have to play them role. The role's good, but we know beyond the roles there is another role, which is the real role, or the real identity. And that's our relationship with Krishna. So, don't neglect the material, but at the same time keep your eyes focused, your mind focused on the role. So, we honor living beings in the, in the material world, but we also keep our mind focused on where we're going. Some of us may like London. You might want to come back. But <laughs> it's, it's not like 
Coming back again means to again go through that whole cycle of growing up. But if we can finish up, what is it? Some people think, well, that's nice. Go back to the spiritual world. Well, what's the spiritual world like? What do you do there? You just sit or sit around and chant Hare Krishna all day. <laughs> The spiritual world is whatever you see in this world, whatever you are trying to achieve in this world, is there in its perfection. That's a, a summation of the, how to describe the spiritual world. Whatever aspirations, desires, and, and longings you have in, with, within the category of, of existence, in other words, what is the greatest of all longing? The greatest of all is love. And try to find love in this world. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And what appears to be love is sometimes something different. But in the spiritual world, that exists in its perfectional stage. And that's where it comes from, our spiritual existence. Our love for Krishna is pure and perfect. And that same love expands itself out to all living beings. It's not that you just love Krishna and you don't love anyone else. When you love Krishna, or when you're developing your love for Krishna, you naturally have love for others. And how is that love exhi exhibited? By serving. So in the spiritual world, everyone is serving Krishna, serving each other in various different ways. And there is eternality, there is full knowledge, and there's unlimited happiness. And there is also variety. It's not like it's a, you just, you know, it's just boring up there. <laughs> There's plenty of variety. This world is full of variety, but this is only a small, tight, and small portion of the variety that exists. And so if you study our books very carefully, especially Nectar of Instruction, Nectar of Devotion, and you can see that they're in the relationship between the living entity and Krishna. There's so many different aspects to that loving move. And it plays itself out in so many ways. So the spiritual world is real. And of course, we may not have any experience of that spiritual world. But there's two types of understanding truth. There's one is that you experiment, you hypothesize, you conjecture, you use your intelligence, you take knowledge from other people who have done the same type of approach, and you formulate some conclusion. But that knowledge is always limited and sometimes, many times, wrong. Real knowledge comes from, from the highest source and down. And that's called, it's two terminology, aro, avaroha and aroha. Avaroha means knowledge going up. Avaroha, a, aroha means knowledge coming down, avaroha. So perfect knowledge comes down from the perfect source through the chain of perfect masters that comes to here. So we get that knowledge of the spiritual world, although we don't have any experience within our our waking consciousness. Although we were in the spiritual world, we were there. In fact, our time in this world is insignificant in comparison to our existence in the spiritual world. But sometimes how we have left that realm, and we are here, now we're trying to get back. Trying to get back to that realm. But that realm is, is pure, it's perfect, and it's, it's, it fulfills all desires completely. So, therefore, in getting back, there is a process. The process is, of course, to glorify the Lord by chanting the Lord's holy name. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna, 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 is a very essential and high spiritual principle because if we can't honor each other, we can't honor God. We can't fully honor God or earn the proper way. So, as Christ said something really nice, he said, What you do to the least in my kingdom, the least 
in my kingdom you also do unto me. So how we treat each other is a reflection of our relationship of, how, of our relationship with God also. So it's simultaneously. We love and serve God and we give honor and respects to others. That's the nature of the woman. And especially we give respects to mothers. Because they provide a very great service within society. A tremendous sacrifice to be a mother. Tremendous sacrifice. And Prabhupada, when he was describing what is selfless love, sometimes when he, Prabhupada describes sometimes what is real love, and he explains what is not real love. But he was saying the closest thing you can find to real love in this world is the mother's love for the child. Because the child cannot simply reciprocate what the mother is given, but still the mother gives. Without asking, it's natural for the mother to love the child, to care for the child, to sacrifice for the child, to do whatever is required, to give the child whatever it needs. So, therefore, in, in the culture of respect, uh, mothers rank very high. <laughs> So that's why in the Vedic culture we refer to women as mother, the Mataji. <clears throat> Mataji is a very respectable term. When you call a lady mother, you're actually giving her honor. Sometimes people don't understand that because of our tradition. So it says that a devotee, her, a person sees all women as mothers except his own wife. <laughs> life is different. You treat your wife as your wife. But you treat all ladies as mother. How is that? Honor and respect them. Not exploiting them. Everywhere you see billboards, signs, pictures, it's all about exploitation of the women class. It is destroying the whole society. Really. When the women class are exploited, and misused and abused, men cannot be happy either. Because if the women are not happy, the men are not happy. That is a fact. Both in spiritual culture and in material society. Because mothers are the foundation of life and nourishment of care. So we're trying to create a real culture within this, what we say, dysfunctional culture. And it starts in different ways, but it starts in giving honor and respects to others accordingly. So I'm very happy to be able to speak on Mother's Day. So sometimes ladies ask, well, if men treat us like mothers, how should we treat men? And both of us are like son. <laughs> then that takes it off the, the sensual platform and brings it onto a more caring and more concerned like type platform. Okay. We have ten more minutes. Is there any questions? Yes, way in the back. Thank you. soul is equal and the soul and no it's not um to really to to answer your question you need a combination of the male and female principle within your practice of krishna conscious if you don't develop the heart the intelligence will not take you far enough and if you don't develop the intelligence the heart can mislead you so we, 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 therefore, we need both, the mother and father principle. So therefore, in the case of women, it's generally women are guided by superior intelligence. 
and men are guided by that, that, that spirit of compassion, concern, love, and care. Like that. So, therefore, in, in our society, women should be protected, cared for, and, you know, shown, given whatever they need. And men should learn from women how to serve. Like that. So there's no, what we say, advantage or disadvantage as long as everything is in place within the society to provide what each of the individuals need. When there's a disproportion or there's not opportunity, it appears to be something different. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Ben? Benjamin? Yeah. Uh, I changed my name that one. Okay. And um, what I was thinking is sometimes we hear that there have been civilizations that were based on the matriarchal, matriarchal yeah. system. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just wondered if, uh, if there's any validity in, in Vedic culture, if there's, any, if there's any credence to having a structure. Draupadi had five husbands. <laughs> yeah, and she, she was, she, you know, he was equally respected and cared for by each one of the five husbands, the Bandavas, the five Bandavas. There are matriarchal societies. But, you know, you have to go into a little bit of a study on that. I'm not so much, you know, knowledgeable how those societies are, but they are. For our matriarchal society. Our society is too male oriented because we're missing the heart. And when we add the heart into our society, then a man is more balanced. So it's a little, I see if any of the ladies have questions yet. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How would you suggest, if any suggestion, or you would foresee a little bit more heart into our society? A little bit more heart? <laughs> I guess by respecting devotees more. To be able to see that from Krishna's point of view, everyone is dear. So why should we be disrespectful? or exploitative to anybody. So our natures, or not, I'm sorry, our nature, our conditioned nature causes us to act sometimes in the wrong way. But we should check that by higher knowledge. So therefore we should give honor and respect to everyone. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur, one of the greatest of all acharyas, said, I live in this world somehow because, so I live in this world happily because I give respect to everyone. So even though everyone is not respectable outwardly, from the point of view of spirituality, they are because Krishna is in the heart of all the beings. And when you disrespect someone unnecessarily, you are actually disrespecting that Lord in the heart. So with that in mind, maybe we can bring a little bit more of that respect and culture and caring in for our society. Devotional service means to see others more important as your, more important than yourself. That's what it really means. We're in a position of trying to serve, not to try to be served. We accept service in order to give service. So service means that I, I'm there for you, not that you're there for me. <laughs> That's what it means. Imagine if you have a society like that. Here's a story. St. Peter, okay, so a man goes to heaven, and he says, St. Peter, what's the difference between heaven and hell? Can you show me? Okay, St. Peter says, okay, well, wait, let's wait till lunchtime. <laughs> so he said, we'll go to hell first. <laughs> so in hell, everybody sits down to the table, and all the food's in the middle of the table. And everyone's sitting on the table around. So everyone has these long spoons. 
and the idea is when they ring the bell, it's time to eat. <laughs> so the bell rings, and the spoons are long, so everyone is just trying to drag it, and then because the spoon's so big, to turn it around and put it in your mouth is really hard. That's hell. <laughs> so everyone is just going into the food and just trying, and no one's getting any satisfaction. So he says, okay, now show me heaven. So heaven, they go to heaven. Same setting, the food's in the middle. And big table, everyone's sitting around. They all have these long spoons. It's time to eat. They ring, so the person dips it in and feeds the person over here. And feeds the person. That way everyone's getting something to eat. <laughs> difference between heaven and hell. <laughs> so when we live for others, we actually find happiness. And when everyone is like that, then it's the spiritual world. Yes? Please, can I ask you, uh, women after they get married, you know, sometimes they can't have children. What is the reason? What is the reason why? Why they can't have children. We know what Prabhupada said? Prabhupada answered all these questions. <laughs> He said, generally, if a woman doesn't have children, it's the man's fault. <laughs> generally. That's biological, but I meant uh, spiritually. You know, is it something from previous birth? Oh, you mean the karma? Yeah, karmic, yeah, it could be. It yeah. could be is also. It, it could be karma factor. If you're talking biologically, it's usually the man who's not potent yeah. enough. But from the spiritual point of view, there is a karmic factor. That could be there. But how do you know your karma? Mm -hmm. So you have to keep trying <laughs> to have a child. And then when it becomes obvious, like there's a prayer for Lord Chaitanya, a beautiful prayer glorifying Lord Chaitanya. And it says at the very end of the prayer that one who prays regularly with faith will have a wonderful child as a daughter or son. So if you follow that prayer, and you don't get a wonderful child, that means you will have your karma or you have one. Someone once said that it may be because uh, the woman, whether she was a woman in the previous life or a man, may have had a lot of children, and, and maybe in this life. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so one devotee told me, he said, he, he said, in this life I get blamed for a lot of things I don't do. <laughs> I get, you know, accused. And then he went to an astrologer. Astrologer told him, "Yes, in your previous life, you got a lot of credit for things you didn't do." <laughs> <laughs> so you're getting your credit. <laughs> you want to hear a story? Yes. This is a nice little story. Because you can never figure out the ways of God. Don't try to figure it out. If you try, you become confused. So this story may illustrate what, what's the position of God. So there's a deity in the temple, and the deity's there, and everyone's coming and praying to the deity every day. And of course they're asking for different things. So there's one simple, common laborer in the temple, and he is cleaning the temple. So he's watching every day people come in and seeing the deity and offering prayers. So one day he starts to think, I wonder what it's like to be the deity. <laughs> what the deity is listening to all day, you know? Because he's seen this like for years. So one night, he goes to sleep and the Lord appears to him in a dream and the deity says, you want to be me? I'll let you be me for one day and you can experience what it's like. But there's one condition. When you're up there, don't say anything. <laughs> Don't, no matter what happens, no matter what the prayers are, be quiet. <laughs> so, he says, all right, sounds like a good experiment. So he's up there, he's the deity. So the first person comes, he's a rich man. This is a great story. It has a lot of, a lot of meaning to it. So the rich man's praying, my dear Lord, please, I want to make more money. <laughs> so many things. And he takes out his wallet and he gives a donation to him, puts it in a box for the deity. And he's just like enthusiastically praying for more money. And he forgets his wallet. And he leaves. So he's, he's there as a deity. 
can't say anything and I've forgotten his name. He remembers I'm supposed to be quiet. So the next person comes along. He's a real poor man. He's simple. He can hardly live from day to day. Very pious. So he starts praying, my dear Lord, I, have a, I can't even live from day to day. It's hard to eat. Please give me some, some money, something, so I can exist. And if I get something, I'll use it for your service. So he looks down and he sees the wallet. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That was wonderful. <laughs> so he picks up the wall, he's thanking the Lord, he leaves. So he's, he's still up there as a baby. <laughs> so another man comes along, he's a sailor. And so he's coming and he said, My dear Lord, I'm about to take a very dangerous journey on sea. Please protect me. So while he's praying, the rich man comes back. And he's looking for his wallet. He can't find it. He sees the sailor, he says, you stole my wallet. The seller says, no, I didn't. He says, yes, you did. I know, because I just left, and I know the wallet was here, and you, and you just came. So you stole my wallet. So they're arguing. Indeed, he's up there. He can't say anything. <laughs> so the man decides to call the police and arrest the seller. So he does. The police come, so he can't, he can't be quiet any longer. <laughs> and he speaks. The deity speaks. He says, no. That he didn't st steal it. It was it was taken by someone else. So the rich man is oh the deity's actually told. He apologizes to the sailor, uh, begs for his forgiveness. He leaves, and then the sailor says thank you to the deity for, for getting me free from this jail. And then you know the next day the Lord appears to him. He says I told you not to say anything. <laughs> You ruined the whole thing. That rich man, he was so greedy, he made all his money by cheating, so I made him forget his wallet. And that poor man, actually, he's going to take that money and he's going to use it in my service. And that sailor, he was about to go on that journey, and he was going to die on sea, and I was going to have him arranged for him to get arrested so he wouldn't have to go on the journey. <laughs> <laughs> can't figure out the ways of the Lord. <laughs> it's just, you know, our intelligence and our abilities don't really fit into the, the logic of God's way of doing things. If it was, that would be as good as God. So we can never really understand things. All we can know that whatever the Lord does, we just have to do our part. That's all. That's all. Nice story? Yeah. Yeah. Really nice. I like that story. I just heard it. Someone just sent it to me. It really, really makes a lot of sense because on this level, things don't sometimes don't seem logical, fair. But on another level, there's something else happening. Another question? There was someone else? I saw some more hands. Yeah. I have a question. In your lecture, you mentioned that uh, led women fall, there are seven types of mothers. Yeah. But uh, I consider that all mothers and the would be mothers, which means the women fall, are all mothers, yeah. are respectable. Mm -hmm. Also, according to me, it is a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three types of mothers. One is Gomata, mm -hmm. Gomata, mm -hmm. and Sargomata. Yeah. When you see exactly. the man, exactly. when you see the man, therefore the womanly qualification, you respect mm -hmm. to that stand, respect the That's man right. or yeah. Purus, yeah. with that respect as you respect your mother. Yeah. So these are. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Yeah, in other words, giving respect in all cases and understanding that. The principle of mother is there throughout existence. Do we have? I'm getting I'm getting the plug, and I have to stop the class. It's time for Prashad. We're having questions and answers, right? And that's where upstairs. Okay. So someone maybe can explain what's next, and if there's more questions, we can take time and answer them in the next venue. Well, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day.
<laughs> Happy Crystal Conscious. Thank you very much. Is that Mr. Nirmani Maharaj? Yay! So I'd like to thank Maharaj for coming, spending time here. Maharaj is actually second time he's come here today. He was here this morning. And as Maharaj is mentioning, he's uh, going to be giving question and answers upstairs in our seminar room, which is two floors up from here.